Uh, I'm going to talk a little about the click history, how it all started and uh, how it has developed over the years. So it'll be a small historical odyssey over the last 20 years. So first of all, my name is Henry Kronström. I have been with the company since the beginning. Uh, I'm known in the community by my initials HIC. So I'm, I'm called Hick. Everyone calls me Hick in the company too. And I'm sure that some of you have read some of my blog posts on Click Community. Uh, my background in the company was, as I said, I started in 1994 already. And I have all the time been working in the borderline between sales and development. I have been product manager, I have been pre-sales, uh, and I've built many, many customer applications. I've been very often in a situation where I am together with a salesman and trying to solve the customer problems. So I know quite well what we can do with our product and what we cannot do. The last eight years I've been working, first of all, as technical product advocate, meaning doing presentations like this and writing blog posts. And now the last few years I am uh, the principal product designer, which means that I work internally on requirement specification for the next product. So right now my area is how do we make ClickSense more powerful? How do we put all the good ClickView features into ClickSense? so that it becomes easier to have a mixed environment between the two products and also there shouldn't be in the end any discussion about which product to choose. ClickSense should become as good as ClickView. Uh, everything else is a failure as I see it. So that's what I'm working with right now. Anyway, the company, we started in 1993. And just to show you uh, how many years ago that was, how long ago that was, I have some pictures. First of all, Bill Clinton was inaugurated as president for his first term. And in Russia, Boris Yeltsin, Bill President. I talk a little bit about Russian, but I already said everything. And because of that, I will continue in English. <laughs> and in South Africa, Nelson Mandela has just been released out of prison, but he was not yet president. The clerk was still president. In this country, you had just gained your independence since a couple of years. And uh, anyway, 1993, that's quite some time ago. If you were watching television, then you were most likely watching Seinfeld, an American comedy show. Or if you were slightly younger, you were watching Will Smith in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Or if you were really young, then you were watching Power Rangers, God forbid. Um, when I make these presentations, there, there, I sometimes have people in the audience that say, that, well, I was born that year. I didn't watch any of these things. <laughs> if you were playing computer games, then you most likely played Miss or Doom, and you played it on a computer that ran Windows 3.11 or 3.10. Now note that Windows at the time was a 16-bit program, and the computer was very limited. A high-end computer had these data, and it was really not very much of a computer if you compare it to what we have today. My, my cell phone here, here has about 1,000 times as much memory as that one has. So it was very limited. Now, I want you to note two numbers here, for those who are slightly technical here. It was a 16-bit operating system, and the typical computer, or the high-end computer, had 8 to 16 megabytes of RAM. Now, think about that. The idea that we have in this company is to load all the data into primary memory and analyze it there. And this puts some limitations on it. 16-bit, well, you can address 65,000 records, not more. 65,000. Compare that to what you're loading in ClickView or ClickSense today. 8 to 16 megabytes, well, today we talk about 8 to 16 terabytes on the servers. 8 to 16 megabytes, that's nothing. It's really nothing. So we were very limited at the time. Anyway, 
These two gentlemen founded the company, Björn Berg, Stefan Gestrelius, and both had technical background in trying to help normal users uh, using computers and using computers to improve quality on whatever they did. Björn came from Tetra Pak and Stefan came from AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical company. And their idea was how can we improve quality and empower people by using computers and software. And this was fairly new at the time. This was in the time when people talked about flattening the organizations and empowering people at the lower level so that they could make decisions and not have so much hierarchy. If a normal, let's say, a, the, the person at the check-in desk at an air company can solve the customer problems without having to ask her boss, then everything will become more efficient. The customer will be more pleased and you can get a more efficient company. So, empowering the users, and that's still part of our ideas. We should empower the everyday user with data. They founded the company Quick Tech, and Quick was standing for Quality, Understanding, Information, Knowledge. Now, we tried to register the word Quick to make a trademark of it. But that's not possible. Anything that contains the word quick is too general, not allowed. So what happened was that we changed the name. Anyway, this was my first business card. I'll come back to the changing name. This is my first business card because one of the founders, Björn, he had this idea. He wanted to employ smart people, people that were smarter than himself. And I had just graduated, so he, well, he thought he was smart. But note the title here, Special Projects. That means everything and anything. <laughs> so he didn't really know how to use me at the time. Anyway, back to the name. We tried to, reg uh, to, to uh, register quick. We were not allowed to. But then we realized that if we just change the quality, the quality understanding into quality learning, then we can have click instead. And that was some possible to register. So we changed that to quality learning, interaction knowledge, and I suddenly was product manager. Now, it started a couple of months before that, uh, when Bjorn came into my office and said, that, well, hey, I want to color code information using green, white, gray. And remember that Bjorn, he came from Tetra Pak, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a company in the city of Lund in Sweden. And you all know what Tetra Pak does, I guess? Milk cartons. Yep. So, the Tetra Pak business idea is to sell huge machines that take a roll of paper and fold it into a package here and you, then you pour milk into the tube of the paper and you glue it and you cut it and you get a milk carton in the end and just, you have a big huge machine in which that just spits out milk cartons and then they sell these machines at an expensive price. And these machines are huge beasts. You can see a picture of one here. So you can have the paper roll here, you have one of the operators up here. And for a customer to invest in such a machine, that's a lot of money. And then Tetra Pak had several machines. And some machines could handle milk, some could not. Some machines can handle liter packages, some could not. So just deciding which machine to invest in. That was a big problem. And that was a problem that Björn wanted to solve. So basically, if you think about it now, there were a number of entities, like machines, paper quality, content types, opening times. You know that sometimes you have a flip type opening, sometimes you can tear it off, and sometimes you just have a hole to put a straw in. These are different opening types. And then you could glue a straw on the side, you can have different package sizes. In the United States they want gallons or half gallons, they don't want liters. Whereas here in Europe we would never accept anything but liters or smaller sizes. And then you can have pallet sizes and so on. In addition you have a number of rules and relations, meaning that most machines cannot handle fruit juices. Some machines cannot be equipped with straw applicators, others can. Some machines can have small package sizes, but not big, and so on. And suddenly you can see, this is a database. This is data, and you want to analyze data. 
So a typical example of a customer question was that, well, which machine should I invest in? If I want to pack fruit juices in a 250 milliliter package and I want a straw on the side. Now, there are three demands here. Fruit juice, 250 mil, straw. He doesn't care about all the other entities. So he wants to start clicking on these three things and then see what the result is. Now, all the other tools on the market at the time were hierarchical, that you had to start in some, some other place of the information so that people couldn't relate to it. Which machine or which paper should you choose? And I don't know. The customer typically just wants to click on those three things. Fruit juice, 250 mil, straw. So Bjorn's idea was, let's make this color-coded. Let's them have click on whatever they want to click. And then we will answer with white and gray. The green was selected, white and gray was the result. So the logic could be, fruit juice implies aseptic filling and that excludes a list of machines. 250 mil, that could imply a specific package and that would exclude the specific straw applicator. Or if you choose a square lump package, that may, might exclude fruit juices. So just by selecting fruit juice, you may want to see exactly what machine you want. Now I'm going to show you the product, or the prototype that we made. And for that I have started a virtual machine, because this is a 16-bit program. I cannot run it on my 64-bit modern computer. But I have it here. Let's start it. And the way you should read this now is that the green column to the left, that's the entities, the field values. And then it's just a list of field values to the right. Now remember that this was just a prototype. We didn't mean to make it beautiful. But the idea now is that if I click on edible oil, then you can see what happens. It's color-coded. You have yellow values, you have green values, you have gray values and white values. Um, yellow is alternatives and we still use to yellow today in click view for alternatives. Green here means implied value, the only possible value. You have to have that. Whereas blue was selected. Now the reason why the colors are different from green, white, gray was of course because the developer that did this, he was a stubborn guy and he wanted to do it his own way. He never listened to what he was told. He always did it his own way. And that I would say was probably the, well, the reason why we were successful. Because he was a smart guy also and he did the right things. But in this case it doesn't matter. But he wanted the colors differently. But here you can see that it works. And I can make other uh, uh, selections also, of course. Now I select the straw applicator. And I can see here on this line that filling machine, I can choose between TBA3 and TBA8. Whereas if I clear my selection and I select fruit sacks, meaning fruit juices, then suddenly the filling machine is implied TBA9. So just by making one click, fruit juices, I know what filling machine to buy. This was a prototype. Very, very nice. However, Tetra Pak, they didn't buy it because they, well, for some reason they didn't see the use of it. But we had at ClickTech seen that this could be generalized. This could be made into something much, much better. So we immediately disused whatever we learned from this prototype and made it into a more general product. We made QuickView. And QuickView is very much similar to what you still today have. The same selection as I just had looked like this in QuickView. You, you click on fruit sacks and suddenly some entities are, or some values are excluded and others are employed. You can see here that TBA9 is the only machine that you can use. Now, ClickView, or QuickView as it was at the time, just contained what we today call the logical inference, meaning the color coding. Uh, so there are no numeric calculations whatsoever, and we can only load 16,000 distinct values. But Håkan, the developer, he said, who wants to load more data than that? He, he couldn't understand that at the time, but he changed luckily. Quick view looks like this on my virtual machine. 
Beautiful, right? <laughs> Håkan, the developer, was very proud of the marble background here. <laughs> anyway, for those of you who have developed applications, you will now see that there are many similarities still today from the very first version. I edit my script. I can, collect, I can use data from ODBC, meaning a database, or I can load text files. And here I will take a text file that is tab separated, OK, run the script, the script is lightning fast, which it isn't today. I add the fields and I am up and running. And you can see in the first version the list boxes are spread out evenly. We got a bug in ClayPy 6 where all the fields were, all the list boxes were just piled up in the upper left corner and that's still not been fixed. Still like that. So you have to move them around. But here it works and you can see now that it, it works very much the same as you would expect. You click, you get results. Now the anti-climax here is that this is all I can show from the quick view one because we couldn't do more. There were no numeric calculations and that means we don't have any bar charts, we don't have any line charts, we don't have any tables, we don't have any calculations. This is all you could do. But we were outselling this. And in fact, I must tell you a small story about when we sold it to AstraZeneca, that we loaded their clinical trials management system into QuickView. And a clinical trials management system that is a list of the substances that they are developing right now that they want to get approved as medicines. And they test it at different hospitals. They have a number of patients. They have a number of doctors responsible for the tests. And the tests are performed at, in cities and countries and so on. So all this metadata around how the tests are made were in this clinical trials management system. And what happened was that I clicked on a substance and suddenly United Kingdom was excluded here. Meaning they didn't have a test for this substance in United Kingdom. And I didn't know what I was clicking on. But the room went silent and people started looking at each other and said, we must have a test in United Kingdom. We didn't know this. They were totally unaware of that they had missed this. So just by clicking, and this, remember this was in the proof of concept. So just by clicking randomly on a substance, they learned something new, and they learned it from the gray values. So two people left the meeting to initiate a study in the United Kingdom, and AstraZeneca bought the product, of course. So with this, I want to say that this logical inference is in fact quite important. You learn new things, mainly by the gray stuff, mainly by what you see that is excluded. And frankly, if you think about it, that is the selling point that Click has. There are no other products that show the excluded. So here you can sit and play around with data, suddenly find something that you didn't know because it's grey. That to me is business intelligence. You see, if you know what the question is, then you usually know the answer. This is about finding the questions. and You have to let people click around to find the questions. This was the people that developed the click view, the first one. The brain, Håkan, very, very smart person. Jonas Nachmanson, he was managing the entire R&D. He was very good at saying no, um, which is important because that made us focus and keep within limits and deliver something. Much more structured than I am. I was out selling to customers, building apps, and going back to Håkan, telling Håkan what we should develop. And Håkan said, no, can't do that. No, no, wrong, wrong idea. But that was a good thing with Håkan. He always, he didn't give a damn about what I said, but he listened. He listened to the problem. He wanted to know what the customer problem was. So by giving my solution to it, to what we should do. Then Håkan realized that what the problem was and he came back to me two days later and said, well, you know the problem you were talking about? I've solved it. Not in your way, but in a better way. And we've done this over and over again. And it's just a way of communicating as I see it. 
He gives the solution, I deliver the problem. And then we had the brother of the, one of the two founders, Stan, who was our entire test department and uh, was sent out to customers for long-term consulting also. So these, this was the four people that really developed QuickView. Some marketing material. The marketing material today is a little more professional than this one, but this one struck a chord with many people when we showed it to customers. We mainly showed it to financial people, and financial people were not always on good terms with the databases. They couldn't always do what they wanted, so they saw that we need some kind of man-machine interface here so we can extract data and make data more uh, digestible for the user. We were out at fairs selling. That's the marketing department, that was the CEO, that was the sales department, and that was product management. And this is at Sebit in Germany, and here you can see a little about the language that we use to sell ClickView. Make your information available, business intelligence, data mart, data viewer, all up. We have, all, we have always had a problem describing what it is we sell. And at this time, there were too many terms in the market. Sometimes we called it executive information systems, sometimes decision support systems, and so on. There were many terms for it. Now, business intelligence has settled as a term. But frankly, at, in the 90s, business intelligence usually meant something else. That meant looking at the, at the competition and seeing what the competition was doing. So, changes your business perspective. Yes, that we did too. Now, over the years, we have added more and more features, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but I will mention a few. If I understand correctly, you started in 2005, 2006, somewhere here, around ClickView 7 then. Six. Six, well. okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I will, as I said, mention a couple of them. And the first thing is, Remember I said it was 16-bit program initially? Well, we very soon delivered 32-bit because that was coming around 94, 95. And then some years later, we had the same transition again. Here we have 64-bit, two different versions of 64-bit computers. And roughly at the same time, we have computers that have multiple cores, so we can have multi-threading inside the product. And this sounds like techy stuff, and it is. But what it meant business-wise is the following. First of all, from 16-bit to 32-bit, then we go from limiting ourselves to 65,000 records, and suddenly we can load two gigabytes of RAM. And two gigabytes of RAM, that corresponds more or less to one million records. You could get a little more in, depending on what, how the data looks. But one million records, that means that suddenly we can load transactional level data of a mid-sized company. We can load their entire database at order line level. And this was new, this was unheard of. The competition at the time, they could only load aggregated data. And then you had to make drill down. And then suddenly you were in a situation that you had to follow the train of thought decided by some IT person and you couldn't click on whatever you wanted. So, by loading transactional level of data and in combination with allowing people to click on whatever they want, we suddenly could make a very, very good analysis of a mid-sized company. And at the time, we sold only to mid-sized companies. Then the same thing happens again some years later. Going from 32-bit to 64-bit. What does that mean? Well, instead of two gigabytes, we have one terabyte of RAM, perhaps. Sometimes, if you have a Windows server or an advanced version, then you can load even more. But what this means is, oh, again, transactional level of data, but now for a large company. So by going 64-bit, we became enterprise ready. We could really load everything of a large company into memory. So this has business implications. It's not just technology. It really has business implications. And the third bullet, single core to multiple core, meaning that you have many processors in the same computer. That, of course, meant that we could introduce what's called multi-threading that use parallel computing inside the computer. 
and that meant we have faster evaluation, you have shorter response times. You can combine 10 million records or so with fast response times. No one else could do that at the time. Today, other companies can do it too, but we were the first that really could do this at a large scale. So, here you can see very clear business implications. And that happened around 94 and around 2002-2003. Today, we are working on next um, quantum leap, and that is cloud. We'll see if it really becomes a quantum leap or not. I'm quite confident that the elastic solution, meaning that you can spin up or spin down servers according to needs, that will survive. But I frankly think that the cloud itself, not so sure, because I know that in business intelligence, we talk about confidential data, there are many companies that want their data on premise still. But I have talked to many large companies and they say that, yes, we want the elastic solution, that is the cloud solution, but on premise in our own computer center. And that we will enable too. So, uh, around 2000 we got a new management. Because up until 2000 we frankly had not made very much money. Uh, we had lost money every year, red numbers, and we were that far away from bankruptcy in fact. And then these two guys came along and they were, Mons was one of the investors, and he said, I won't give you any more money. I will kick out the old management and put myself there. And then Mons told us, well, well, first of all, we need a sales organization. We didn't have a proper one before. He also said, don't touch the R&D. That works. Don't change what's working. But we need a new sales organization and we need to have focus. So he said, we focus on controllers. We focus on Movix and JD Edwards. And for those who are techies, you know that these are two old ERP systems. And the good thing about Movix and Jade Edwards is that they're very common for mid-sized companies and they're very standardized. So I could, as a techie, then have a small diskette in my back pocket. We go out to the customer, I enter my diskette, which has a prepared application. I run the script in a prepared application towards their database. And within minutes, I had something to show for the controller. And they, of course, they dropped their jaws completely. They were used to having projects that were weeks or months long before they could see the first result. And here I could show it to them in the same day. So we made proof of concepts that were two or three days long that basically had the framework for a solution. And they loved it. And they bought the stuff, of course. So by focusing on controllers, who had the pain and the money, and by focusing on Movix and J.D. Edwards, we could really focus our sales efforts on something where we were efficient and made money. And that's thanks to those two guys. They saved the company. They also introduced company culture and core values and tried to build further than that. And they planned for a, an IPO, meaning going public on NASDAQ, which we did. And here you have the ownership and management history. So between 93 and 2000, we were owned by the founders mostly. Uh, we, got, we did get some uh, venture capital, but not very much. But with the new leadership in 2000, they were very focused, got, uh, they were very focused on getting more investors on board. So after 2000, we were basically owned by the investors and the main ones were Excel and Jerusalem Venture Partners. And 2010, we went public on NASDAQ. Very efficient. Uh, then we were, in fact, private again six years later. We were bought by Tom Bravo. And the reason why we were bought by Tom Bravo, we can discuss that. I think they got a too good price. But what happened was that the stock price didn't increase as much as expected. We made profit and we grew. So we, did, we delivered those two things, but the stock price did not still increase as much as expected. So Tom Bravo, they thought, if we can buy this and we can reshape the company to something better and they will most likely sell us sooner or later. There are no signs right now that that's imminent. So I think that they will 
wait until they have a very good price. And right now we are developing fast, we are growing, we have a technical solution which evolves more and more and we're making profit. So they are not in a hurry. We'll see what happens, but my guess is as good as yours. But my guess, anyway, is that they will keep cool, stay calm, sit in the boat, and then they will sell us. But if that happens in two years, four years, or six years, I have not a clue. So, that's basically the history. And I'm going to end with a quote, and I've said it once already, but to me it's very, very important. The quote is from one of the two founders, and that is, if you know what the question is, then you already know the answer. And that's why we need business intelligence, not to find the answers, but to find the questions. Thank you. Questions? <laughs>